911. What's the address of your emergency? I'm at this parking lot at the top of the lamp in. Okay, what's going on there? I really call myself. And I want the police to come get the money. Any idea what you want to do when you grow up? I want to try to um, go to the Olympics and win a gold medal in skiing. Once you are identified as an Olympian, your world changes dramatically. I went six years straight without ever missing a single day. It was a compulsion. It was necessary. Winning the gold medal, I was like, that's what I want to do. What we're asking these young men and young women to do is to invest thousands of hours for this one moment. Your whole life has gone into like six minutes. For me, it was 23 seconds. Oftentimes, that's it. For some, it's like being an astronaut who's gone around the world and touched the face of God. And then he comes back and he says, here's your office over here. I was born into a society that taught me if you win an Olympic gold medal, you're going to be set for life. You're going to have all the money in the world. About half of the top 10 U.S. ranking athletes make less than $15,000 annually from the sport. You're going to be happy for life. A good 80%, maybe more, go through some kind of post-Olympic depression. I really control myself. He lost his identity. He didn't know who he was or what direction he wanted to go. You know, depression is, is, a, is a dark demon that, that is very good at, at hiding itself. I did want to commit suicide, and, and it's crazy. After all this pressure, everybody's just loading on me, and like, and it's, it's, it's the pressure that I wanted. Steve Holcomb's race for gold! And I tried to kill myself. You have so many things provided for you. But one of the things you don't have is a real resource to talk about and to help, to open up to somebody. I think there's no question that Olympic athletes need more support. Looking back throughout my career, I don't think anybody really cared to help us. They're really deep, so be careful. Okay. The chairs are very, very deep. I know. So. <laughs> very big. You feel like you're just lounging up here. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'll admit I'm a little nervous uh, because each of these people could be up here for an hour and talk with you. One of them already was. Um, but there's a lot of important topics that came up. Um, we didn't get a chance to introduce ourselves. My name is Seth Feuerstein. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at Magellan Health. I'm a faculty member at the Yale University in the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, founded and run something there called the Center for Digital Health and Innovation. Um, Hi, I'm Michael Phelps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Brett Rapkin, the writer and director of The Weight of Gold. Hi, I'm Sasha Cohen. I'm a figure skater in the 2002-2006 Olympic Games. Hi, I'm Katie Ulander, four-time Olympian for the sport of skeleton. I'm Barbara Van Dalen. I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm the president and founder of Give an Hour. Give an Hour provides free mental health care for a number of different groups, our military, <laughs> service members, veterans, their families, and other at-risk groups. And I'm also a child psychologist. So uh, we're going to try to get in some points from everybody on the panel. Uh, I was, you know, it's, ner it's nerve-wracking enough to sit with somebody like Michael, uh, who I've known for some time, but not everybody. Uh, I was talking to Oren when he gave me the list of presenters, and I said, you know, this is, this is pretty heavy. Uh, and, and he offered to try to level the playing field and turn this into a race down 7th Avenue uh, on the blacktop. One person would swim, one person would wear skates, one person would be on the skeleton. Uh, I would get a Porsche. <laughs> uh, if, if 
Michael got lucky, it would rain. <laughs> I asked my friend if I could borrow their Porsche, and she said, let you drive my Porsche? You don't know how to drive a standard. I don't trust you. Um, never the, and so we changed the format. Brett probably would have won the race carrying a camera down 7th Avenue. The odds in Vegas had him probably winning, so it's a good thing we changed the format. Um, I want to start by talking about adolescence, uh, if that's OK with everyone. Um, particularly, we'll start with the athletes, I think. Uh, one of the things that came up earlier was this idea of being underwater for all those years mm. when normal people, not that you're abnormal, but I think you know what I mean, uh, normal people are out there experimenting, learning how they communicate, learning their boundaries. Uh, we could start at the end with Katie if you're up for talking about that, and then come across back towards me if that's okay. Thinking about adolescence, being an elite athlete, kind of that interplay for you, and what it meant to be somebody training for and, and appearing in the Olympics. Uh, for me, I think it was slightly different because my father was a Major League Baseball player. And early on, he instilled some of the best virtues, I think, in regard to sport and life. And he taught me to value my effort over the results. Um, I ended up playing baseball with the boys because I wanted to be challenged and um, just took on everything I could despite knowing I'd potentially lose. So I think it innately prepared me to compete in the Olympic Games, um, but once I was immersed in it, I was definitely susceptible to a different type of environment and culture. Sasha, go ahead. I think looking back, I have a perspective that I didn't have at the time. Um, I was a kid that was diagnosed with like ADD, and my mom put me in gymnastics for three hours a day to get, uh, to, you know, to use up my energy. And then I found skating, and it was just this vehicle that kind of I, I loved, and I had goals, and, and I just felt really alive, and I had this sense of like freedom, and you know, like I felt like I was flying when I was skating. But now, going back, you know, I was homeschooled from the time I was 12, and I never, you know, I never like wrote for my school paper. I never explored any any other interests. It was just like, okay, you need to like pass this class, and and in four years, will you be ready for this Olympic Games? And in eight years, and what are you going to peak? And and so now it's like I'm having this kind of rite of passage and this almost adolescent time, like in my 20s and 30s, um, trying to figure out what I'm interested in and what else I'm good at. And it's um, it's difficult to do that once you're you know, the best in the world at something, and then you go back and you start over 10 years after everyone else. It's like really hard to find identity again. Mine's pretty similar. I was diagnosed with ADHD as a, a young boy and went from the baseball field to the lacrosse field to the soccer field to the swimming pool, one thing after another, basically just trying to unload all of the energy I possibly could. Um, fell in love with the sport of swimming. My mom put us in the water for water safety, and um, my sister was number one in the nation, number three in the world at 13, 14, and um, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to travel the world and swim and have the chance to be an Olympian. And, and uh, after five Olympics, um, I, I finally hung it up, and, and very similar. You know, it's, it's, it's tough because, you know, I... I for a long time, struggled um, seeing myself as an individual. Uh, I just saw myself as a swimmer who was pretty good at following the black line at the bottom of the pool time and time and time again. Um, and, and, you know, for the people in here earlier, like, I joke about learning to communicate at 30, but it's true. You know, I, I didn't really learn, I guess, some of the things that, that you learn as a child growing up, and, and I was all swimming. I was just fully engaged in, in the sport and, and representing my country and competing on international soil. And Brett, you've interviewed how many Olympic athletes at this point for your film? <laughs> I don't know. It depends <laughs> on the day. It just keeps, at this point, it keeps adding up. You know, basically, <clears throat> our biggest challenge now is knowing when to sort of stop because you know, thanks largely to these athletes up here as well as some of their peers, um, it turns out that this is a crisis. And um, you know, now that, that you know, these athletes have shared their stories, I think some of the other athletes, both current and past, are more comfortable doing so. 
Um, so we've got to be up to like 12, 15, but I mean, it could be. There's way more. It could be 100. There's way more. If we kept going, it's, it's, uh, it turns out it's a crisis that is far greater than <clears throat> I could have ever imagined as somebody out, you know, obviously outside of the Olympic institution. Uh, Barbara, you started out, and by the way, she's humble. So Barbara, you know, Time Magazine, 100 Most Influential People in the Globe kind of person. Uh, so just, just so you're all aware, she's sort of the gold medalist of therapy, I guess. Um, in case you missed it, I think she just did Steph Curry's. <laughs> uh, so you started out focused on active duty uh, reserves, National Guard, I think. Mm -hmm. In 2016, I think you opened it up. Uh, you may be a little tired. She was just in London hanging out with, you know, Prince Harry and, you know, people like that. So, uh, but if you have the energy to tell us, uh, I'd like to hear a little bit about, you know, we heard earlier today, we heard a little bit now about the life, the focus, the structure, uh, and then when, I don't know how you want to describe it, when that changes, when the, when the stage lights go off, whatever, oh, it's making me a little nervous for when this panel's over, but when the stage lights go off, then what? Which is, there are some similarities actually to people in, in the service um, and their family members. So, so any sort of insights into that? Well, I think, and thank you, Seth, and it's, it's thank you to Talkspace for doing this. I mean, I, I think, you know, I've been sitting here this afternoon thinking that, um, you know, Brett, you mentioned that there's a, a crisis, and I think there's a crisis in our society that I think um, the people who have been speaking today um, and, and others around the world are starting to, to m step forward to say a different version of Me Too. This is all of us, this is all of our story. And um, absolutely, in the military and veteran space, um, similarities in that you know, the expectations that are put on young men and women and their desire to perform and to serve their country, and, then, and, and they do, and then they come home and sometimes either because of what they came in with, and this is, I think, very true with athletes as well. You know, it, we, are, we are humans first. Um, Mr. Phelps said it earlier very beautifully. You know, he's a human being first. And whatever that means in terms of genetically and psychologically and experientially. And then when we, for re different reasons, try to shove people into, you know, boxes or lanes where they're at the expectations and the functioning is this and it doesn't allow for the developmental needs, there's consequences to that. And, and, and or, in the case of the military and veteran space, when people experience trauma as part of that young life experience and they're not equipped to deal or tolerate. And I would say, you know, again, the, the elite athlete, there's a lot of, uh, we are coming to learn, sadly, a lot of different, different kinds of trauma goes along with that experience too. And so I, I think the good news is, you know, I've, I've been doing this for a while and when we started working on culture change, nobody was talking. But now it's like this really amazing explosion of conversations. But we can't, we can't, be, um, we can't be complacent because there's so much, so many people who are suffering, so many teenagers who even though we're talking here, they are still driving and their coaches are not seeing this can be destructive to them. I think it's great that you referred to him as Mr. Phelps. We had a chance <laughs> to talk a little bit about that at lunch. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating thing to me, this uh, reference to people we don't know by their first name and we don't know them. Correct. Uh, which I think is an interesting thing and has an impact on people, both celebrities, professional athletes, uh, celeb you know, uh, elite Olympic athletes. Uh, I went and looked up Mr. Phelps on the internet. Uh, there's limited access in the room, so don't do that. Um, what do you think comes up? This is the audience participation. If you, if you do an internet search for Mr. Phelps, you think he comes up? No. No. I mean, I don't know what Google knows about me. Maybe I'm searching for Mission Impossible all the time, <laughs> and so it knew that I was interested in that old TV show. You actually get the Mission Impossible TV show from you know, long enough ago that even I don't remember it. Um, so I think that's an interesting thing. Uh, in some ways, you're completely anonymous, I think, to people because they think they know you and they don't. So mm -hmm. that's sort of anonymity. And on the other hand, the intimacy that comes with addressing people by their first names is sort of an interesting thing. Any thoughts on that? 
Um, it's, uh, I, I don't really know. I mean, I guess I could just go back to like what I was saying earlier. Like, I mean, and correct me if I'm not answering this right. Um, but it's no like, right <laughs> but, but I feel like at times, like I'm a zoo animal. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's yeah. so annoying. Like, honestly, like, I, I guess I first started really calling myself that when we were at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado and we see all of these people that are coming to visit the training center and we're in the pool and their faces smeared up against the glass looking in at us. <laughs> and it's like, we'd always be like, oh, don't feed the animals. Like, don't knock on the window. Like, don't disrupt them. Um, and And every day, like, I mean, I have people coming up to me that are saying, why are you not competing again? I want to see you swim. Mm. <laughs> like, yeah. dude, like, that doesn't define me. That's not who I am. And, and that's something that, that recently has truly just frustrated the living hell out of me. Because it, that's not, who, like, it's a part of my life, but that's not me. That's not who I am as a person. And, and I think, you know, if at some point in our lifetime we can treat everybody like human beings, I think it potentially we could live in a better place, but will we ever get to that point? Because nobody sees us really as, nobody sees me as, I guess, as a human being. They just see this kid that was pretty good at jumping in the water and swimming up and down the lane. Um, and that has to stop. Because we are humans just like every single person in here and every single person in this world. It was really a decoy question. I wanted to take your water bottle. That's fine. Go ahead. And say that I had Olympic water. <laughs> put it on eBay. Um, so I switched the bottles while you were Perfect. No worries. No worries. Um, can, I, can I just, I think that's such an important point. And it, I think there's a societal issue here that maybe we're all a little bit guilty of. You know, I mean, my, my two daughters were, were swimmers. And when you were talking about the eight hours, I was like, that was me. Yeah, of course. And um, they buy into it. Their coaches buy into it. The parents buy into it. And, and I think there's this weird with celebrities and athletes and heroes. You know, we are a hero-worshiping society. And we do this to ourselves. And we, mm -hmm. we teenagers are very, this is what this is all about here today. Teenagers are very susceptible to want to be that hero up there, and sometimes we, the adults, kind of feed that, and then it's, uh-oh, now when you're, you become that first name basis with the world, the zoo animal, then, then we, don't, we don't sort of think anything other than, well, isn't he fortunate? Isn't he lucky? Right. So I, I think there's a lot here that society needs to work on, our society, we individually, if we're going to turn this around. Any other comments on that? I mean, it was pretty thorough, but any, um, any other thoughts? I, I'd have to agree. I think that it has a lot to do with opening up the conversation and looking at authenticity and truth in that there's a big difference between performance and mental health. So we're able to compartmentalize, as I'm sure some of the military veterans are, to go out and push things aside and focus on execution which is really great, and a lot of adolescents and kids focus on that as well, understanding like, I can get A's, I can do this, but who am I outside of that? And understanding like holistically how they approach life, and I feel fortunate enough to have had at least a little bit of a basis in my father explaining that the effort is what would define me. The satisfaction I got out of participating and putting my best out there in truth and honesty and integrity, and I have to say that four Olympic games, I started to lose that. And it had nothing to do with those virtues not existing. But somehow, the focus became so specialized and so like, controlled by the generalized other. In, in an, example, an example of like, what my coaches expected, what the public expected. So after my father passed away and they stuck a camera in my face and said, how does it feel to lose your father, mm. I just, didn't know what to say other than what they expected me to say, which didn't put me in a position to think about it for myself. So I think it's a matter of bringing out the humanity, not just for ourselves and for who we are, but to let the generalized other society and kids know that there's more to it than just what you accomplish. Mm -hmm. To expand on that, it's like the kind of Eastern value of being and the Western versus doing that we only have value based on what we do. And I think that's like very toxic and you need to have a very good 
um, idea of who you are just as like as a person and what you like and the people that you love. And I think if you've started in a sport from a very young age, I felt that I was very socially conditioned, that I will be liked and I will be accepted if I can do this jump and get this medal. And so it kind of created this cycle that I have value in the world and I will be validated if I can win this or if I can skate perfectly. Mm -hmm. And so your kind of whole self-esteem and identity is wrapped up in that. And kind of going back into kind of the mental health issues with adolescents and with teenagers, especially in sport, I think what's so difficult is you know that you're anxious and you're depressed and you're alone, but you're like, well, yeah, I'm competing in the Olympics and there's gonna be like millions of people watching me, like maybe this is normal. And, and you, you don't talk to anyone about it because you don't wanna show weakness. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's only much later and you know, kind of talking to people that competed and you're like, oh, you felt that way too? Mm -hmm. And then once you're not alone and you can talk about it, it just, it takes down all these walls, um, but there's, there are so many things, and I think for me, um, you know, I, being an athlete that um, hasn't continued to compete and was not someone like Michael, who, you know, you have a, definitely a much, your life is, is kind of like in a fishbowl, and like everyone knows who you are when you walk down the street. And for me, you know, I had a little bit of that right when I was competing, um, and I always felt like I had to say like the perfect thing. I had to meet everyone's expectations, and they'd be like, "Oh, you broke my heart when you fell," and like, or, and then again, like cameras in your face, like, "Are you so devastated? How are you gonna like live with this?" Like, and I'm like, "How how political is that though? Because they don't even give you a chance to think about it. They're basically telling you what you should feel." Yeah, and it's just and all, and all you're taught to do is like put up a brave face, right? Mm -hmm. And like no, you, you can't like break down on camera, and you can't be like honest. Like you have to be a put together human being. And I think it wasn't until like my 30s and kind of I went to I went to college like much much later. I started at 27. I went as Alexandra, and that's my legal name. But I was always, if someone knew that I was an ice skater, I'd be like, oh, like now I have to be careful what I say, or like I can't drink too much. And you just feel like there's not room for you as a person and you as the image. So if people are seeing you as that ice skater that competed like 12 years ago, I'm like, oh, I have to like be this image of what they think they should be versus like I just wanna be a human being and make mistakes and explore and have opinions. And I didn't feel like I had permission to do that when I was like an athlete and like a public figure. Mm -hmm. These athletes are, um, especially the Olympic athletes, are in a position where you know, they don't have a lot of opportunity to find a lot of balance while they're training for the Olympics. It's so demanding. Um, a lot of them sacrifice, you know, getting to go to college or even high school. So when they eventually retire, which is often a hard, a hard decision or not necessarily in their control sometimes, they have to figure out who they are, um, you know, oftentimes in their late 20s or early 30s. And uh, you know that's why it's really inspiring to see to see Michael doing this kind of stuff, to see Sasha doing all the great things she's doing, and uh, and Katie about to start figuring that stuff out too. Oh goodness! But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Katie's on on the precipice. <laughs> but um, but you know to be acknowledged that she's uh, done so much incredible learning on her own through studying and sort of really guiding your own education from what I've gathered, which is really impressive. Well, yeah. thanks, and I, I just have to say, Michael, thank you, because you didn't have to create this platform for the rest of us to speak, and um, it means a lot, because, yeah. you know, I'm a sport that nobody knows, and nobody knows, like, what I do or who I am, and it helps create identity for those that are just kind of boxed into the Olympic brand, mm -hmm. so thank you. No, it's, it's, it was needed. Brett, talk for a minute about what I'll call word of mouth advertising for the fact that you're interviewing athletes and kind of give an example of when you open the floodgates, people coming to you, because we just had a conversation about that, just to, to build on the wave that was just referenced that Michael helped start. Um, can you tell an anecdote about that, I think? About how more athletes are participating? Yeah, are, are coming in without you even reaching out. <sighs> yeah, I mean, for those of you that don't know, I mean, the project started with... Uh, an interview with Stephen Holcomb, who you saw in the trailer, um, who was Katie's best friend. Um, they were both living in Lake Placid at the training center. And I interviewed Stephen for uh, what I just planned on really being sort of a short film that you know one of his sponsors would put on social media. 
because we had the same eye doctor in LA and his story was incredibly inspiring. He had survived a suicide attempt and then won three medals, including the gold. And uh, 12 days after I did that interview, um, he passed away. And uh, at that point, the project was, you know, I, I didn't know what I was going to do with it. And at the same time, I started, first of all, I read an article about post-Olympic depression. And then I started to see more about um, Michael starting to share his story um, originally with Tim Layden from Sports Illustrated, but then in different places. And the light bulb went off of like, whoa, this is a much bigger story. But at that time, I had no idea it was as big of a, an issue as I know today that it is. So what's been happening is as I've you know, gone out and interviewed more athletes, you know, these three here plus probably a dozen others, they've been talking to each other. And they've been telling each other about this project and, and who's involved in it. And we've all been kind of, you know, people tend to, tend to assume that like all these athletes like hang out at the same bar or like on, <laughs> are on a group text or something, you know, like, <laughs> that, that there's some like summer Olympian group text. <laughs> there's not. No, there's, there's not. not. And there needs to be more, you know, conversation and, and opportunities like this away from the Olympics to, to powwow because they go through a very unique thing. But um, I mean, just to share what happened in the last 24 hours, you know, I interviewed Katie this morning and she texts me yesterday and says, um, you should call Lolo Jones, who's, you know, another Olympic star. She, she's got a story to tell. Hmm. And I was like, oh, has Lolo had mental health stuff? And she's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> I call Lolo, I'm at the Philadelphia train station because the day before I was in, interviewing Gracie Gold, who's a 23 year old figure skater who missed the last Olympics because of <laughs> mental health stuff and is doing much better. She went to the Meadows as well. Mm -hmm. um, Lolo Jones is like, uh, I can come to New York tonight. And so today she did an interview with like, 10 hours, you know, two hours notice. It was pretty awesome. And, you know, it's been amazing to just, I really feel like a conduit at this point to let these amazing people um, share something that I think a lot of them have been suffering about in the dark individually. And for them, I'm observing them seeing, oh, you've gone through something like this too? Like, it's just, um, it seems very cathartic. And, you know, ultimately the film's gonna have uh, a really powerful effect. Uh I think, not to interrupt, but I think you, he said something that struck me. He said, we're going to flip the script. And I think up to this point, I don't know how you feel, Michael, Sasha, if we really had control over our own stories. And I think this is an opportunity, not just through social media or this us coming together, but to create a voice and change. You know, the scrutiny we we were scared of is finally gonna be more embracing, I think, because we are able to tell the truth in a way that's more human. Um, and I think that's gonna benefit everyone in knowing that you don't have to be perfect and everyone's just a little bit crazy, you know? Yeah, we were talking today, I mean, you know, Lolo who um, hit, a, hit a hurdle in her biggest event, which she says was like one of three times she's ever hit a hurdle, even in training. Um, you know, she, she failed on the biggest stage. And as soon as you guys come off the ice or out of the pool, uh, immediately they've got their mic in your face. And we're talking about why isn't there a five, 10 minute period where you guys can go decompress, talk, see your family, see your coach, talk to a therapist, and just, you know, just decompress on what you just experienced, good or bad before you've got you know, TV stick and a microphone in your face to try to get that raw emotion. Um, you know, those sort of things are, are important and, and hopefully it evolves, I think it will. So you referenced amazing people doing amazing things and then coming here and, and being willing to talk about the transition for them. I, you know, the, the world is filled with amazing people, right? And so um, in some ways it's relative if I'm in high school and I'm an unknown but I'm trying to make the varsity tennis team and I'm, or whatever team or just show up for school and I accomplish that, uh, that for, for that individual might come with a huge rush, right? It's 100 on a scale of 100. Um, and then something goes haywire for them, maybe they injure themselves or maybe they get cyberbullied. Um, and we saw a high school person come up here today and do something that I thought was, was pretty amazing. Um, 
that relative decline in terms of the peak of how you feel and then the drop off. Um, I don't know if you've seen that in other people in your lives who are not famous. Uh, any context or sense of that and whether, is it truly that different for you or is it just that everyone knows who you are? Have you ever thought about that? Any thoughts about that? Well, while they're thinking. <laughs> so I was just in London and we did, uh, some of the work we do is about changing the culture of mental health. So we did our summit, um, our second global summit. And one of the people who I had the pleasure of having on one of our panels, it was an influencers panel, was a rugby player named Leon Lloyd. And he was a huge rugby star. And he had to retire early because of multiple injuries. And rugby, as we know, is a bit of a rough sport. And he had had all these surgeries and he was recounting when, when the doctor came in and told him. And it was so sad, he, he was sharing this on stage that he actually, he had just had a baby, and he actually had the thought, if the devil walked in right now and said, I'll take five years off your life, but you can finish this season, he would have made the deal. And he said it was shocking to him when he realized later. So Leon is now the CEO of an organization um, in the UK that is focused on the non-famous athletes the athletes who are on their way to become and they end up, you know, their career gets shortened or they're, they never make it to the next level because what, there's, what they have found is all these things apply. To your point, it's relative. If you are on your way somewhere and then that's taken away or, or it can't happen or it doesn't happen, and, it's, and not, it's not only the expectations that you have, it's all the people around you who you feel like, oh my gosh, here I was, I'm coming from a, you know, maybe a lower, lower SES family, and this was my family's big dream, and now I've, I've disappointed them. And so I think this notion of relativity that we were talking about, it applies at any level of any, any, any human that's in this context of achievement-oriented and focused. So that's a really exciting effort in the UK. I hope we see it here. I hope we see it across the pond because in our sports system, our feeder leagues, and the, those things are happening over and over and over again, and it's, you know, if this kid isn't the star pitcher, there's a bunch behind him, and so who cares, except for that kid and that family. And we even heard that from that Mr. Was, Phelps, right? Yes. He said, look, there's someone behind me, right? Is that, is that that mentality, too? Yes. <laughs> Grace like, that's, what, that's what I thought, like, because, I mean, it's true, like, we're athletes and, and we're coming up through our sport, whatever, and then when we're done, they're like, oh cool, there's 10 people back here, yes. so bye, see you later. Right. I'm gonna work with them and push you out the door. Yep, you're bye. a product at yeah. that, right? And, and That's I think how you got your spot, because I... Yeah, perfect, <laughs> thank you, I appreciate that. He's next. And, and I think what the UK effort is about is we can do both. We can help kids learn how to compete, learn how to succeed, learn how to achieve, learn how to do greatness, and be emotionally healthy at the same time. What a concept. So I, I think it's possible. Somebody asked it, about whether you felt like it would interfere with your ability. I think that's a common struggle that people have. If I deal with these demons, will they stop driving me? And I think the answer is not necessarily no. No, because I mean, if, obviously when you compete, you want to be physically prepared, but mentally you have to be just as just as prepared and just as strong to be able to endure what you're about to go through so i mean it makes sense you have to be prepared that way you should be what barbara was referring to is we had a lengthy conversation about this idea of relative decline right so it doesn't matter who you are if you're an elite athlete or a high school student or a college student uh, you have your certain goals you have your certain targets you've experienced often something really good and then all of a sudden the olympics ends or the season ends or you uh, lose or whatever, and then problems. there's this large decline for you. Um, and I, I coined this phrase, the theory of relativity. <laughs> I thought like, well, I'm a Jew, I'm on an academic faculty. <laughs> this seems like a good thing, a theory of relativity. I think it'll catch on uh, for this field. <laughs> My mom will be proud. Um, <laughs> so I I, I'm gonna read um, a couple of quotes to some of you, get your reaction to them. They're not your quotes. Uh, for you, Sasha, this is a quote of another Olympian. You know, as Olympians, you set four years to build up to this moment. And then, after it's over, you're kind of lost in a way. You don't really know what to do. You don't know where to go. 
you don't know who to talk to. Any reaction to that? It's absolutely true because the way that I looked at the, the Olympics and like February 27th or whatever day would be my long program, it's like I couldn't imagine the day after. It's like the way that you know that you're gonna die but like you can't really, it's not tactile, you don't understand it. It's like I have no idea what I would do the day after but, and again it's because 100% of my identity was wrapped up in I'm a skater and I need to be my best and I need to win at this moment and if I don't, there's no do-overs. I can't like retake this test, like it's gone. This moment's taken away from me and there's just, especially not being on a team sport, you know, there's so much in your head, like you can't really control injuries and you're, you're wondering am I doing enough or not too much and it, the pressure of that is so much of what you need to do and you start counting down the days, which doesn't help you, like 571 days and, then, and, and it just, I think it just adds to that that kind of momentous weight, and um, you, you're not even thinking about what's happening after, because like, I didn't have a balanced life. And, and I was completely lost, you know, I was kind of sad, and I was in shock, and you just kind of, you don't know what to do with yourself. Um, so we had the chance to talk about that a little, that was, that was a leading quote in question, so thank you for following that path. So we had the chance to talk a little bit about um, what you did end up doing, I sort of, happened to read, I, I subscribe to this thing called the New York Times. It gets delivered on paper to my house on the weekends and I actually touch it and hold it and read it. And there's this great column I love on Sundays that kind of just looks at people in their ordinary world and you were featured in that. And it was a pretty rem memorable piece and you talked about certain things stuck out. You, know, you go to yoga, you meet friends for sushi, pretty ordinary stuff. Uh, I don't really remember, but I don't even think it really talked about the Olympics at all. It didn't talk about ice skating at all. Uh, do you remember sort of how you got into that rhythm? Was it just, did it just sort of happen? Was it intentional? Like, like... I think I spent so much of my time so siloed and so focused. And it's difficult because, you know, I decided to go to college and explore. And I, I worked in media and at a startup and now in finance. But it's like, who am I? And I'm trying to find myself. And like, what am I good at? And what am I interested in? And so you asked me, you're like, how do you describe yourself? I was like, I can't. Like, I don't, I don't have an identity like, anymore. I'm, I'm figuring it out, and I'm trying to give myself permission not to know. Um, people are like, what do you want to do? What are you going to be next? Like, we know you're an athlete, and you're an Olympic athlete. Like, whatever you do, you're going to be great at it because you have discipline, you have focus. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not sure what's worth that much of my life anymore. <laughs> um, you know, I've done that once for 20 years, like, with my head underground. And now like, I want to tra travel and I want experiences that I never got to have before. And, um, you know, I used to be training at the rink on like Christmas and I could never like, go anywhere. And, and so life experiences, relationships, like learning who I am as a human being is like my main purpose. But it's really hard because the world's like very disappointed in you. They kind of like have their head like this. They're like, oh, like, like what you don't you have a, like a plan and a goal. And it, it's like. People, Western culture doesn't place a lot of value in being and being like this like well-developed person. It's like, what are you gonna do? And, and that's hard, because I know inside that that's the right thing, but I'm, again, always seeking outside approval and validation, so that's, that's my personal battle. She did tell me more about it. She's doing some really cool things, so you know, stay tuned. I, uh, so Michael, on that note, shoot, my quote, the screen locked. So I'll tell you, listening to you earlier, you said people come up to you you're obviously doing amazing things. People come up to you, they tell you uh, their story. You, you may or may not know this, you're in Manhattan. You can go to the Upper East Side, you get $1,000 per hour for them to come tell you their story. So it's something to consider <laughs> as you figure out uh, your path. Uh, there's one quote I want to read to you that unlike the last quote, which was you, yeah, not you. Like, as soon as he was reading that, he was like, that sounds I was familiar. Like, I think I've like, said that before. So he to me, <laughs> I was like, I think, you were all looking at her, he turns to me, he's like, I think that's that my mean? quote. <laughs> uh, we have a couple, couple minutes left, so it happens to most athletes leaving the sports world, and I'm no exception. I felt my morale and confidence drop as the real world humbled me. <laughs> okay, no problem, I can start again as long as I know where I'm going. But people keep telling me that's not how the real world works. The path won't be revealed to you before you start. There are few goals as difficult as making it to the Olympics and representing your country in a sport you love, but there are also very few goals as clear. Does that make you think about anything? Um, I mean, 
it, it's like sitting here and, and, and listening to you guys, it's, we have the same story. You know, like we've gone through the same thing. Like, and, and it's, it's just so wild to me that even though I know it was all happening, like it basically, I, like I knew that a lot of athletes are struggling and do or do and are struggling um, with mental health, especially coming out of games. Um, it's it's so bizarre because I honestly I retired once, I came back, retired again, and I was like, oh yeah, it should be easy. Like I learned everything in the first retirement. Like I'll be good. Like it'll be kind of simple to get my feet on real land and not be in a water and in a pool and be able to move forward and do what I want to do. And it's just like, it's, it's so similar. Cause it's like, you wake up and I'm like, cool, what am I going to do today? Like, where am I going to go? Who am I going to see? What am I going to work on? Because it's like my schedule for so long, I had people literally telling me what to do, where to go, how to be everything my whole entire life. And now I'm like, cool. Like, how do I live? Like, how do I live in the real world? Because I, I, I don't know. Like I, I literally just had a conversation with my wife a few days ago. I was like, honey, I was like, I feel like I'm failing in everything that I do. Mm. And I was like, honestly, I said, can you just tell me like what I'm supposed to be doing? Like, can you just give me a schedule of a day to day thing? Because that's all I know. And it's like, it, it's so hard and it's so wild. Like every single day I have these emotions that are constantly going through my head. So we're, we're out of time. Uh, a couple, a couple observations. So first of all, um, just a comment earlier in the day for those of you that were here, there was a question asked of you about well, what if you had been in therapy, would you have been as good of a swimmer? Sort of an interesting question. I think it's sort of a loaded question. Uh, just an observation. Actually, if I'm correct, you did have treatment before your last Olympics. For my last one, yeah. I think you I did. did okay. Oh, I thought I did. <laughs> I was stoked. I was, I was really happy with the last one. Yeah, I was disappointed, but as, as long as you're good. Sorry. Uh, and I think the work you're doing is great. Uh, I'm not, you know, I have mixed, I'm ambivalent about talk space, mostly because I didn't think of it. It's my downside. <laughs> uh, but, but thanks to all of you. Thanks for participating. You know, we, we're running over for the day, so we're not really going to take any questions. Uh, but thanks. Thanks for your Can work. And, and look out for the movie, guys? by the way. It's going to be really unbelievable. Can I ask a question to you, too? Like, when you were competing, did you, did you look in the mirror much and, and try to figure out who you were? Or did you ever give yourself that opportunity to, to do it? Or did you just walk past mirrors and not want to see who you were? Um, I don't know if I'm doing, asking that clearly. Or... You want to answer first? I think I was so, like, kind of crushed with the weight of, like, I have... Like I need to win the Olympics and I need to peak. And like that's kind of what consumed me. And for me, I was also younger, you yeah. know, so I kind of ended up stopped. But my plan was like, I want to win the Olympics at 17 and then I want to go to college and I want to be like a real person and I want to do this at the right time. Mm -hmm. And then when I, when I kind of failed at that and I was fourth, I was just like, I don't know, it was like kind of this, like this, I, I have to do, like I have to prove myself. And so I think since then, like the, you know, the, rest of my time in the sport was like I need to prove myself as a skater and I just threw all my identity into trying to be good enough as that and so I never really looked at who I was as a person I think until I was like 20 21 like after for me this is going to sound crazy but this seems that the right platform for that um <laughs> <laughs> came to the right place so I feel like I went into it with an identity but the environment kind of made me lose that. And I think it's because it forces you to specialize in something so intrinsically that it doesn't give you the freedom to explore who you are fully. So like Nietzsche talked about, you know, different personalities that exist all at the same time. And it's just a matter of what situation you're in that you're gonna have that one unfold. And I don't know if you guys have seen The Darkest Hour about Winston Churchill. Mm -hmm. Yes. And there's a moment where he's like, well, I wonder who I'm going to be today. <laughs> you know, and he comes out and he's just like a total jerk to random people or sometimes he's nice. And I feel like the Olympics at the moment don't truly give you that freedom because there's so much pressure to be this person that the generalized other expects. So the moment when I lost my father, I think, is the moment I lost my identity. The minute the camera got in my face four days after his funeral and said, how does it feel to lose your father? I hadn't even had time to process that myself to really figure out what that meant. And I was obligated to respond 
as what the expectations were. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, I've done four games now and having lost Holcomb, I feel like I've begun to come full circle and take a stand, but mostly because we're creating space to talk. Not to be, you know, cheesy, but it's true. Like, yeah. <laughs> no, for sure. like we need a place to be real, to be our, our true selves and not have fear or uh, wonder what the scrutiny will be like. At this point, I'm just kind of like, bring the scrutiny. <laughs> this is it, you know, so. Thanks. Thanks for the question, that was great. Thanks.